You know, God's choice of leadership is far beyond any choice that man could make, even if he's well-educated and established and all that. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV, and we're, we're studying the Bible. We're into a great book. It's called For Samuel. We're going to study chapter 12 in about three minutes. It's going to be really good. So stay there. Corey and Ryan are coming up in about 15 minutes. Corey? I'm going to be doing a study on the life of King Saul and talking about his uh, public anointing in 1 Samuel 10. Ryan? Well, similar to Corey, today my segment is all about the downfall of King Saul. Why exactly did God reject Saul's kingship and dynasty? A very, very good question and very interesting. Janice, what did you do? Today, what is our witness? All right, so get your Bible guide out. Turn to today's passage. If you don't have a Bible guide, we'll tell you how to get one. Open up the Bible. Let's listen to God. First Samuel 14, 1 through 14. Now it happened one day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who bore his armor, Come, let us go over to the Philistines' garrison that is on the other side. But he did not tell his father. And Saul was sitting in the outskirts of Gibeah, under a pomegranate tree which is in Migron. The people who were with him were about six hundred men. Ahijah, the son of Ahitub, Ichabod's brother, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh, was wearing an ephod. But the people did not know that Jonathan had gone. Between the passes, by which Jonathan sought to go over to the Philistines' garrison, there was a sharp rock on one side and a sharp rock on the other side. And the name of the one was Bozes, and the name of the other, Sina. The front of one faced northward opposite Michmash, and the other southward opposite Gibeah. Then Jonathan said to the young man who bore his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many, or by few. So his armor-bearer said to him, Do all that is in your heart. Go then, here I am with you according to your heart. Then Jonathan said, Very well, let us cross over to these men, and we will show ourselves to them. If they say thus to us, Wait until we come to you, then we will stand still in our place and not go up to them. But if they say thus, Come up to God shows his power. Uh, that, that's amazing. And I think a lot of people would love to see that. But the problem is that we like to show our power and do what we want to do, not what God wants to do. And that's a problem. First Samuel 9 to 12. Today we're talking about first Samuel 12. Now, 14 judges were called and sent by God to deliver Israel from bondage and lead them in the right ways. Samuel was the last of these judges. Now the judges led Israel at a time when there was no king. When Samuel was old and gray, God told him to anoint a new leader over Israel. But this time it would be a king, not a judge. You see, Israel desired a king, and so God anointed a man for the task, and Israel agreed. But Moses had spoken to that particular nation about how God would lead them. God commanded Israel to walk humbly before him. God was to be their king, 1 Samuel 12, 12. But by the time of Samuel, they seemed to have forgotten how to the sovereign Lord was powerful. God is also desired as an earthly king. Like the nations around them, they wanted a king, not God. Well, God gave them exactly what they wanted, a big, strong man who looked the part. Now, through Saul, God would show them how their idea of kingship was fundamentally flawed. Even so, Despite our sinful nature, 
human desires, God always desires to help us. All things would be well for Israel if both the king and the people prayed for one another and followed the Lord with all their heart. Now you can read about this in 1 Samuel 12, 14 to 15 and 19 through 25. Today, what we're going to do is we're going to go forward a little bit. Last year, we talked about the first part of this chapter, but this year, we're going to begin with chapter six or verse 16 of chapter 12. And Father, I pray today that you would speak to our hearts. Help us to read from the scripture and know exactly what you're telling us. And I thank you, Father, for all you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, keep in mind that if you don't have a Bible guide, call us or write to us and we'll send you one. And we want to thank you for the donations you make because, I mean, it costs us money to pay for the postage to get it to you and everything else. So thank you for your donations. Or you can go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com and click on the Bible guide and you can do it there. Download it exactly how we printed it. Verse 16 of chapter 12. Here is what the Bible says. Now, therefore, stand and see this great thing which the Lord will do before your eyes. Is today not the wheat harvest? Samuel says, I will call to the Lord and he will send thunder and rain that you may perceive and see that your wickedness is great, which you have done in the sight of the Lord in asking a king for yourselves. So Samuel called to the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day. And all of the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. You know, God's choice of leadership is far better than anything man can choose. We need to pray for God's direction as we select our leaders. We need to pray for God's direction as we select our leaders. Something very important that we need to hear this year, when everybody's getting ready, whatever it is that we decide to do, we need to allow God to influence our hearts the right way. Lord, I pray today in the United States of America that we would allow ourselves as Christians who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, guide our hearts so that when we go to the voting booths, we will select whom you have chosen. Help us, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Now we go on to read verse 19. Here's what it says. And all the people said to Samuel, pray, pray for your servant, the Lord. Pray for your servants, the Lord, your God, that we may not die. For we have added to our sins the evil of asking for a king for ourselves. They understood the violation. Our human selections for leadership will always be flawed. Now, I want you to just, just leave that up on the screen because I want you to see this. Our, our human selections, our human selections for leadership will always be flawed. We need to repent personally and ask the Lord to show us who he has appointed to lead. Did you get that? That's very important for us to understand. We need to understand that the Lord has chosen people and we need to get with his plan. You know, uh, we have free will, but our free will, I don't have free will. I have responsible will under Jesus Christ. So I, I have to do the things God speaks to my heart to do. We need to do that. Now let's take a look at these last several verses. Because this is the selection of a king, and they're going to end up with King Saul. But nevertheless, it says here, Then Samuel said to the people, Do not fear. You have done all of this wickedness. Yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. And do not turn aside. Okay? Serve the Lord with all your heart. And do not turn aside, for then... You would go after empty things which cannot profit or deliver, for they are nothing. For the Lord will not forsake his people. The Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it has pleased the Lord 
to make you his people. Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you, Samuel says. But I will teach you the good and the right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart, for consider what great things he has done for you. But if you still do wickedly, you shall be swept away. If you still do wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and your king. Every generation has a choice to pray and follow God or to follow its own desires. Every generation has a choice to pray and follow God or to follow its own desires. Beloved, when we vote for leaders, they are not just for us, but they impact the world. They impact the world. There's no way around it. When we just think about what we want and what we're comfortable with and all, that's interesting. But the Lord's will is so much bigger than that. God is concerned about us, but he's concerned about the world as well. So beloved, we need to pay attention to this. It's very important. So when everybody's placing ads around and doing all kinds of things, we need to pray and say, Holy Spirit, show me the truth of what's going on here so that I can, because the Holy Spirit doesn't lie to us and will never lie to us. Let's ask God who is to be our leader. Hi there, Bible Discovery TV is available to you 24 seven. If you have Roku, you can download our app and you can watch all of our programs at your own convenience. We're also available on Amazon Fire. So just search Bible Discovery TV and you'll be able to find us. Did you know that Bible Discovery TV is available on your phone? You can watch the program whenever and wherever is most convenient for you. On iPhone or Android, search for Bible Discovery TV in the App Store. Well, King Saul, such an interesting and, you know, I, I think people have so many different opinions on Saul and his character and, and how he was chosen. But when we really look at the details of the scripture, we see God telling Samuel, that one, choose that one. Why? Why, why, why? And I love this topic. I've done a, a whole six part Bible study on this topic, on the life of King Saul. But today I wanna to give you a quick overview and then I wanna talk about a really interesting detail from 1 Samuel 10. Check it out. The biblical figure of Saul, son of Kish, marks a major transition for the nation of Israel, who at the time had been existing under the leadership of Samuel, acting priest and judge. Samuel, with his distinctively providential birth and continued dedication to God, had overseen a type of revival. But as Samuel aged, the Israelites wanted more structured leadership. They wanted dynasty, a monarch. This demand for kingship went against the order of God. And yet, like many instances in their past, God gave them what they asked for. He gave them a king that was tailored to them. In the text of the Bible, Samuel is told to listen to them and give them a king, even though God tells Samuel who to anoint. This is in clear contrast to the next king of Israel, David. In his case, God tells Samuel, you are to anoint for me the one I indicate. This seems to show that God's first choice of king was in accordance to the state of Israel. He gave them a king they deserved. Then his second choice was for him. David was the king Israel needed to point them to God. This assertion gains some traction when careful attention is paid to the details of the narrative. The way that it's written records the dark, concerning state and even irony of Saul as king. For example, when we are introduced to Saul, we're told that he is the son of Kish, a Benjamite. This family alone made an extremely ironic choice of king because just a generation or so earlier, the tribes of Israel had made a pact to completely exterminate the Benjamites from existence because of their evil that was said to have surpassed even the icon of ancient evil, Sodom and Gomorrah. What's more, we learn that Saul was from the very city that emulated and surpassed Sodom. Gibeah. 
Even Saul's life as a Benjamite would have stemmed from the terrible accounts of forced marriage recorded in Judges 21. These reasons may have sparked Saul's incredulous comment to Samuel when he complimented Saul's family. But am I not a Benjamite from the smallest tribe of Israel, and is not my clan the least of all the clans of the tribe of Benjamin? Why do you say such a thing to me? On top of this, we're told that Saul's father Kish was a man of standing, or a man of valor, which is the same Hebrew word used to describe the evil men of Benjamin back in Judges. Saul is publicly anointed king at Mizpah, where the tribes had gathered to vow to destroy the tribe of Benjamin. And like his surviving ancestors before him, when Saul is sought, he's found hiding from Israel. Saul's first action as king is also to ironically save the city of Jabesh Gilead that was previously slaughtered by Israel to get wives for his ancestors. In Saul, God gave his people the king they asked for, the king they deserved. And then he gave them the house of David from whom would one day come the Messiah. So I really do think that God chose Saul to send a very specific message to Israel in that he reflected Israel and he, he was from, you know, not great beginnings, just like Israel. There's so, so much here, but we know we can see foreshadowing that Saul, even though Saul's great, even though God chose Saul, he starts out well. We see right in 1 Samuel 10, a foreshadowing that this may not go well, right? So we see in the, in the second half of 1 Samuel chapter 10, where God has the people line up and is called by lot first tribe, then clan, or then family, then clan, then Saul is chosen and he's hiding. And this is, is, has a direct parallel in Joshua with the judgment of Achan, where the Israelites are losing in battle because of, because of Achan's sin. And something is hiding in the Achan account as well. And it's the guilt. It's not, it's not Achan himself. There's such an interesting parallel there. We get this foreshadow that God is bringing a judgment, a just judgment to Israel. It's really, now tell us about your thing that you did on Saul. Yeah, I did a six part Bible study. Uh, it's available for a digital download on our website, or you can call in and get a physical copy as well. It's for a donation in any amount. There is a suggested donation amount there, but do what you can do if you're if you're interested. And that's at BibleDiscoveryTV.com. BibleDiscoveryTV.com. That's very, very interesting. Okay, Ryan? All right. Well, in my segment today, we're going to look at some of the specific sins that Saul committed, which cost him his crown, his dynasty, and ultimately his life. While this divine punishment might seem really harsh to us, his sins are actually very similar to some other biblical figures. And just like Saul, they paid dearly for them. And all of these sins also reflect a deeper issue. By all appearances, Saul was the obvious choice for Israel's very first monarch. He was tall, handsome, and humble. In fact, he even lived up to the hype at first. But as time went on, he grew arrogant and proved to have little regard for the Lord's commands and repeatedly failed the test of faith. This was first seen through an unlawful sacrifice at Gilgal. Although he was supposed to wait seven days for Samuel to come make the sacrifices, when the prophet didn't arrive at the appointed time, Saul, at the brink of war, decided to make the sacrifice himself. At another time, Saul made a rash oath which prevented his army from eating until they secured a victory. So faint were they at the end of the battle that they rushed on the spoil and took sheep, oxen, and calves and slaughtered them on the ground, and the people ate them with the blood, something strictly forbidden in God's law. But his final undoing was his defiant disobedience regarding God's order to utterly annihilate Amalek. Instead, he spared Agag, their king, and the best of their sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and were unwilling to destroy them. The fact that Saul's kingship and dynasty were stripped from him because of these failings isn't surprising in light of God's numerous personal forewarnings against such disobedience. It's also consistent with how God dealt with similar sins in the past. For instance, just like Saul made an unlawful sacrifice, Aaron's sons Nadab and Abihu offered profane fire before the Lord. 
Similarly, Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas, used God's sacrificial system for their own gain and pleasure. Just as with Saul, all of these men died for their sins. Furthermore, because Eli refused to put a stop to Hophni and Phinehas' behavior, God removed his entire household from the priesthood, just as he removed Saul's household from the kingship. And just as it was with Saul, all of these men honored themselves and others more than God. And that was the real heart of the issue. While breaking the sacrificial laws was a very serious sin in the eyes of the Lord, it was less about sacrifice and more about obedience to God out of love, respect, and fear for him. As Samuel declared to Saul, Has the Lord a great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you've rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king. So Samuel very clearly lays out the root of Saul's problem, which was a refusal to follow and obey the Lord. See, Saul didn't love God with all of his heart, soul, mind, and strength, and it showed. As Jesus Christ, God in the flesh said, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Saul repeatedly failed to do so. And obedience is what God wants from us. As Samuel reminded Saul, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king. Wow, did you hear that? Rebellion is like the sin of witchcraft. And that's something that Saul later committed as well. Saul clearly didn't have a heart after God, and so God replaced him with a man who did. As Paul the Apostle declares in Romans 11.22, Behold, therefore, the goodness and the severity of God. Let's love God with all of our being and serve Him, because it's all about Him and His kingdom, not ours. Obedience is better than sacrifice. That's very important for us to hear in our money-driven world today. We need to understand that. That's the first step. Very good. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay, Corey, uh, Ryan, or uh, Jana? <laughs> One of those. You, you got those. there. You, you got too, there. Right? Yeah. We do that all the time, don't we? Yes. We even include our pet names in that. It's, it's, it's really quite something. But uh, 1 Samuel chapter 12 is a really interesting chapter, isn't it? With Samuel's address at Saul's coronation here. And we know from going through the scripture here that Samuel uh, was prayed for by his mother Hannah and she had promised to return uh, Samuel to the house of God to serve uh, uh, after God all the days of his life. And we, we see the tragic end of Eli and his sons um, that didn't follow after God. And, and, and here now we see Samuel and it says here, and now here is the king walking before you and I'm old and gray headed, Samuel says. And look, my sons are with you. I've walked before you from my childhood to this day. And he says, here I am witness against me before the Lord and before his anointed. So he's looking at God and he's saying, and before Saul, people, I want you. Um, whose ox have I taken? And he goes through this list of things. He, he wants people to, to bring any complaint or any, any t something that he's done wrong. He wants them to bring it forward so that he can make it right. He wanted to settle anything wrong publicly with God and with Saul as his witness in front of all the people. We go through this and when we get to verse four, they said to him, you have not cheated us or oppressed us, nor have you taken anything from any man's hand. That really is a testimony of a man, this man who really and truly dedicated himself to the service of his God. And today, I, I, I was thinking as, as I thought about my own commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ, to follow him with all of my heart as best as I can with his help, um, that it's a very good reminder. If I were to stand in front of a group of people and say, can you point to things in my life that that I haven't been right, or I, I just need to settle things. And you know, we need to do that personally every day. We may need to make sure within ourselves, not broadcasting it to other people, 
but within ourselves to make sure that our hearts are lining up with the Word of God, with the way that we are supposed to be following God to the best of our ability with His help. I want to bring us some scripture to encourage us to do that. Psalm 73, 28 says, but it is good for me to draw near to God. James also talks about that in his book, but it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all your works. Matthew 5, verse 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Do the things that we work, does that gain our way to heaven? No, that's not what it's talking about because Jesus has accomplished all of the work on the cross. It is finished. That's what he said. But we need to live our lives to follow him, to be that light, to be that witness. Paul writes to Titus, likewise, exhort the young men to be sober-minded in all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works, in doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you. Last one, 1 Peter 2, 11 and 12. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Father, we pray today in the name of Jesus Christ that you would help us. We are trying to learn what it means to follow you. We're trying to understand what it means to choose because Lord, we pray today that we would not just think about ourselves, but we would think about the world and we would think about the people and the 5 million Christians now that exist in Iran. Help us Lord in Jesus name. Amen.